many of these would appear again if we did this exercise tomorrow. But there'd probably be other descriptors that would appear as well. How does this list compare with what most people have been told is good sex uh, by the Christian uh, community? What's the conventional Christian frame for good, good sex? Okay, wait, wait, wait just a minute. I got Let me flip. Let me flip. Okay, and it's what? Procreation. Procreation. Okay. Procreative, married, <laughs> light off, <laughs> missionary <laughs> position, uh, is duty a good way to summarize that? Yeah. Boring. Oh, boring and <laughs> Better things to do, right. Say, so I'm getting a couple of things all at once. Say what? And still remain sinful, even in the procreative. Yep. Always sinful. Role defined. Good sex is heterosexual. It's, it's, it's say what? Efficient. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Very <laughs> private. Private. <laughs> <laughs> Only as necessary. Okay. <laughs> Disgusting. Modest, quiet. Wait, oh, wait, wait you're, you're, I don't want to lose the patriarchal. And there was another one. Patriarchal and quiet. Oh, quiet and shameful. Quiet. Phew. What? Anonymous? Anonymous. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I, I thought I needed clarification. So, no, that's the, that's the other list. Okay. Back, well, sorry. Sorry, I hadn't turned the page. Let's see. Oh, monogamous. All right, right. Monogamous. Honestly, I think um, sacred. Sacred? Like, save it from one person. Keep it sacred. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I didn't say it couldn't. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying to not. Oh, I'm negative. I thought she said no, secret, so add secret up there. It's, it's secret from your kids. Yeah. yeah. Quiet. Quiet. No, no, no. Yeah. Controlled. Controlled. Oh. Controlled. Neat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I want what she's having. Don't you remember that line? Mm -hmm. That was so good. And what would you put on the list? Say what? Safe? Yep. Faithful. Lifelong and exclusive, um, 
lifelong. And exclusive. Yeah. Okay, I think we're familiar. We, this, we, know, we know this, this man. Um, so how did we get here? And how do we claim this as authentically Christian? You know, it's interesting. Almost all those features could be talked about in terms of prayer. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other Uh -huh. Yeah, I think someone had said earlier we we could be describing spirituality yeah. as well as as sexuality. Um, so that's probably not the agenda as to about how we got here. Um, but um, let let me just say a couple of of, of small comments uh, about this. One of the things that I would say is. Uh, what I mentioned this morning during the comment time um, is that I think one of the deficits out of the Christian theological tradition is that we've not had a theology and ethic of sexuality. We've had a paradigm that has either uh, sought to avoid sex or control sex and in the Christian tradition, for the longest time, and here I think of Mark Jordan's historical work in his really interesting book, The Ethics of Sex, where he talks about how the predominant tradition for so many centuries was to uh, elevate celibacy, that the best sex was no sex. And so for Christian disciples, uh, avoiding, not engaging in sex was the higher righteousness. And one of the things that happens with the Protestant Reformation, well, let me like, go back a, a step, but not everyone can uh, practice celibacy in a consistent manner. And so with Paul, if you cannot be like me, unmarried, and if you are burning with passion, better to marry than to burn with lust. Not the best <laughs> argument, if, if, if you must. But, but Jesus is coming soon, so we don't have to... Well, th that would help. <laughs> if, uh, uh, but as Mark Jordan also, I think, helps to unpack is that for centuries, the invitation to marry was never a license for sex. It was never an encouragement to enjoy sex. The expectation was that with youthful passion, marriage is the best container in order to try to restrain passion. And the hope was that you would marry in order to constrain your passion and move quickly as possible from being Christian husband and wife to living together as Christian brother and sister in a celibate marriage. So the, the celibacy expectation was prevalent even around the discussion about marriage. Bob? One of the things in the Catholic tradition is that they reflect on the Song of Songs. What if you start from there to construct a sexual spirituality because it elicits sex between non-married folk, it's ecstatic, it's enjoyable, it's pleasurable, 
And I think many... So Song of Songs, uh, and, and I think it is one of those resources that we stop and say, how did that ever make it in the canon? <laughs> and uh, there was a controversy about whether it should remain, whether it should be pulled out. Because it was sex positive, Renita Weems has this really interesting uh, uh, study of the Song of Songs where she takes it a little bit further in a way that I really appreciate where she said not only is it sex positive, what is important is to pay attention to the body and the color imagery mm -hmm. in the song because she said there are reasons to speculate that this could well be an uh, interracial couple. The woman is described as small-breasted, large-hipped, darker skin, Renita Weems, African-American, New Testament scholars. Oh, she says, I know this body type. <laughs> and she speculates that what's going on is not only a poem to celebrate erotic love, but she says, she speculates this could be a protest song to the community to say, heads up, uh, a non-normative couple are exemplifying uh, erotic pleasure and the goodness of creation, and uh, therefore uh, are exemplifying what is holy and godly. And I like that additional, especially bringing in the uh, 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 racialized lens. In, in the Queer Bible Commentary, and take back the word, Christopher Queen does a very much the same thing with the sexual outlaw paradigm there. Yeah, 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 uh, which I think is so imaginative and, and so helpful. So one of the things is the, the, the Christian tradition for the longest duration has not had a sexual theology or ethic. It's had a, a celibacy ethic or a marriage ethic. Protestant Reformation came and our reformers flipped the celibacy marriage dichotomy upside down and elevated marriage above celibacy, in part because the reformers were so attuned to the reality of sin and so suspicious that no one would be likely to live out a true ethic of celibacy with any consistency, so they assumed it probably was best for people to all marry. So for the Protestant reform tradition, what you begin to reinforce is the expectation not that some should marry, but all should marry. There's a duty to marry, and less and less space then for the unmarried life. And so it's no wonder that Protestant Christianity has been organized around the marital family, because the expectation was responsible good, principled people, when they become adults, get married. And so that's why in so many churches and in so many of our communities, the question is always, why is poor Sally not married? What's wrong with Joe? And so the expectation was, uh, it, uh, Protestantism has generated a marriage culture. And the, the oddity is to explain anyone not married. So if you've ever had the experience of being married and divorced or unpartnered or widowed or so forth, you will find a new experience in church communities because you no longer fit the, the paradigm. Protestantism has reinforced compulsory marriage, compulsory coupling. And I think it's one of the things that's true about U.S. culture is we're a marriage culture where somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of all adults marry at least once in their lifetime, and often multiple times. Think Elizabeth Taylor. And so if you grow up in this culture, including those of us who are gay and lesbian, the expectation of being able to marry has a kind of valence.
we belong to this culture, that's just what you do if you're, if you're normal. 